I don't know how I survived in that condition. I was weak and encumbered, with no means to fight and nowhere to run. I was on the verge of giving up, but then I realized I had a gun. So I grabbed the gun and fired the first two shots. I missed. I needed more space, more time to get ready. But they were this close to me. It was a matter of kill or be killed. So I raised the gun again, prayed to every god known to man for my bullets to find their mark, and then I pulled the trigger. The bright light emitted from firing the revolver temporarily blinded me. It felt as if it had burned holes through the back of my eyes. It took me quite a while to pull myself together. And when I did, the first thing I saw was the body of those two zombies that had been chasing me, lying lifelessly in the snow. I crumbled to the ground, my leg utterly drained and trembling from fatigue. I was finally safe, but for how long? This situation was far from over. A huge group of zombies likely attracted by the gunshot could be fast approaching. It was only a matter of time before they found me, and I had a strong feeling that I wouldn't be as lucky the second time around. So I made the only logical decision I could think of at the moment to drop my heavily stuffed backpack in the woods, mark the location, and then come back once I was ready. Without the burden of carrying a tremendous amount of weight on my back, my escape from the forest became much more manageable. Though I still tire easily from walking and have to take frequent stops to regain strength, it sure as hell beats dying. And we're out. Yes. I made it out of the forest and got back to the mansion around midnight. Oh, how nice it felt to be out of that place. I could swear the air is fresher outside. And the food, man, I must have eaten half a cabinet worth of food that night. I was so hungry. After consuming a case of coke, a jar of peanut butter, and a can of chili for safety, I took a moment to familiarize myself with the revolver. Truth be told, up until now, I have been avoiding the use of any type of firearm during my time here. I mean, it's been emphasized countless times in movies how firing a gun in a zombie apocalypse can exacerbate situations, making them 10 times worse. But you know what? After that brief shootout in the woods, I'm starting to enjoy the excitement and danger of it all. Hello, gorgeous. What are you doing sitting here alone? Wanna come back to my shooting range and burst a few rounds? On the morning of December 27th, I packed the gun and a cool beating stick I found in one of those wash showers and then went straight back to retrieve my backpack. I wouldn't go so far as to say that the trip to recover my backpack felt too easy. I mean, I ran into and had to fight quite a few zombies around the area, which isn't something you would describe as easy. But taking them out felt different this time around. I was more calm. It didn't feel like I was going out of my way to do something extraordinary. Rather, it felt like I was attending to regular chores, like washing clothes or cooking food. It was rather amazing to reach that level of contentment, to be unfazed by what had haunted me for so long, and to become desensitized. After returning to the base, I did some inventory management, transferring items from my bag to the cabinet. I also tried out the breaching hammer, one of the most exciting pieces of loot I risked my life for. To no one's surprise, a hammer with breaching in its name couldn't be used to destroy any wall or tile. It's just a big clunky melee weapon, which I assume would deal a lot of damage, but given my feeling about such weapons, I kinda just left it there for display. In the afternoon, I went across the street to the container area, hoping to find a backup weapon like a metal pipe or something. Instead, I ended up discovering a whole ham radio sitting in one of the containers. You know, I had one back in West Point installed in my workshop, where I would use it to listen to survivor podcasts and occasionally intercept my neighbor's frequency to peek into their personal lives. Do you know Josh, the mailman next door? He would radio his fiance in Riverside every day about what he was wearing. I mean, how weird is that? I'm still wearing the same shirt I wore the day I met you. I miss you so much. Like, change your clothes, man. It smells like your mama's cheese. But anyways, I brought it back and set it up in the library. I turned it on and listened for a while, thinking maybe I would tap into something unexpected, like an emergency broadcast. But everything was quiet at the moment. Deep down, I knew it was almost impossible to find an active channel on this island at this point. But even so, I found comfort in just turning the knobs and listening to the static. On the morning of December 28th, a small pouch in the garage piqued my interest. When I opened it, I found fertilizer and seed packets inside, including seeds for broccoli and cabbage. Cabbages are one of the best vegetables you could grow in a zombie apocalypse, followed by potatoes. They have a high calorie concentration, are rich in vitamin C and K, and on top of their health benefits, they are relatively easy to grow and mature faster compared to other vegetables. Which is exactly what I wanted. As for how the seeds ended up in the garage, I think they were found and brought back by my friend before he went missing. 
May he rest in peace. May he rest in peace. That's bullshit. That's my seed. Why are you touching my... It's our seed now. With enough water at hand and appropriate tools at my disposal, I seized this opportunity and planted the capture seeds right outside the garage. I prepared five patches of planting ground and sold the seeds about one centimeter deep into the soil. I watered them thoroughly, and to finish it up, applied the right amount of fertilizer to each patch. Now all it takes is regular watering, and in about two weeks or so, they will be ready to harvest. I'll finally get to enjoy some fresh and organic food. Speaking of organic food, I stumbled upon some thick, juicy earthworms while digging up the soil. Earthworms are a good source of protein in the wild, with protein levels close to that of fish meat. I had tried a cooked earthworm dish when I was younger, and personally, it tasted better when I didn't know what I was eating. But why eat worms when you can use them to catch fish? That's exactly what I did on December 28th. For the first time, I went out to fish thinking I would prepare myself some tasty dried fish meats before setting out to search for the military base and my lost friend. And the next thing I knew, two days had gone by. I would have kept going if a sudden realization hadn't kicked in when I glanced at my surroundings. I was addicted to fishing. Despite having caught only two, maybe three fish in total, the experience was incredibly chill and relaxing. It made me forget about everything. The apocalypse, finding my friend, the military base, it was like an escape from reality. I returned from my fishing trip on the morning of December 30th. I cooked up all the fish I caught, ate one for breakfast, and went to the library to stash away some books I had forgotten to take out of my bag. Until suddenly, the radio crackled to life with a series of distorted static noises. It was receiving a frequency that was unstable and possibly distant. The brief flurry of sound ceased as abruptly as it had begun, leaving me no time to decipher the message. Sensing its importance, I rushed to the radio, trying to latch onto the fleeting signal. However, before I could finish scanning all the available channels, a gunshot echoed in the distance. I opened my map, trying to trace the rough location of the shot, and all evidence suggested it was coming from within the bounds of the military base. Was it a distress call or an attempt to reach the outside world? Could it be my bald-headed friend trying to get my attention? Or were Rody and Chad calling for extraction? Regardless, I needed to see for myself. Without wasting any time, I began packing for the trip. Food, a close-range weapon, first aid supplies, and a 12-gauge shotgun with three boxes of shells. I was nervous, feeling a kind of pressure akin to opening Pandora's box. I could reveal something good, something bad, or something absolutely uncalled for. As horrible as it may sound, I actually considered calling out the whole thing and pretending nothing happened. It's a cool world. People die every day, no matter how cautious they are. Forming emotional attachments has proven costly. A lesson I've learned the hard way. Besides, who's there to judge my actions or inactions? These walking corpses? Yet yeah, this thought quickly dissipated. It seems that even after all these years of enduring survival, deep down, I'm not ready to cross certain lines. I still cling to my humanity, refusing to devolve into mere animalistic survival. After 30 minutes of jogging and taking down zombies, I found myself checking cars at the crossroad ahead of the military base. This repeated action has become a habit for me, similar to how a bartender might always polish glasses. I did not find any particular car worth noting, but what I did discover was a supermarket just south of the intersection. Inside, I found a huge amount of food still in good condition for eating. So I made myself at home, grabbing as much as I could for a backup supply for the trip. I made it to the entrance at night, and it was quite the scene to behold. Abandoned and burned down car wreck lining up blocking the road, the entrance was wide open with no gate as if it's inviting you in, but the warning sign on the fence screamed, don't do it. If this isn't what the gateway to hell looks like, I don't know what does. Having come this far, there was no turning back. I moved inside as quietly as humanly possible, shining my flashlight around to see if anything was moving in the trees. A zombie spotted me and started wobbling towards me. I didn't think much of it and swiftly took care of it, not realizing that the sound of the encounter had alerted a nearby horde standing just 10 feet away. Ooh, baby. That's a horde right there. I was quickly overwhelmed by their numbers. Despite my best effort to stand my ground, my 38-inch monolith baton broke due to the excessive use. All I had left was a karambe dagger, and it wasn't enough to push them back. So I ran to the trees, using the visual obstruction to my advantage. 
At this point, it was clear that entering the military base would be a challenge with just melee weapons. It was time to bust out the boomstick and give these zombies a taste of America. Even with the help of my shotgun, it took me hours to get past the gate and several more hours to get past the secondary checkpoint. I brought six boxes of shells with me, and now I'm down to my last box. I've essentially paved the road between the two checkpoints with zombie corpses, but they just keep coming. Believe it or not, this situation reminds me of the stories I used to hear from people who went to lose them. However, it wasn't all bad, as some of the zombie I eliminated carried valuable resources, and on rare occasions, top tier gear like the two sets of bombsuit I found. There's no way I can wear this. After dropping off my trophies at the mansion, I resupplied and switched my shotgun for the Daewoo K7 submachine gun. Not for any particular reason, other than having an excess of 9mm rounds. However, once I started using it, the performance of the gun exceeded my expectations in almost every aspect. Not only does it have a built-in silencer that allows me to take down zombies more quietly, but it also boasts a far range, making it much safer for me to engage. With the help of my new gun, I made it to a parking lot that was about 500 meters away from the secondary checkpoint. To my surprise, almost every single vehicle parked inside of this lot was in good, drivable condition, even the cargo truck. You have no idea how much I wanted that truck, but this place is essentially a forest with trees everywhere. Driving the truck out would be more challenging, so I opted for the red jeep due to its relatively small build. As I was meticulously siphoning gas, nearly ready to embark with the red jeep, a distant shout pierced the silence, followed by a cacophony of battering noises. Whirling around to identify the source, my eyes met a sight that gripped my heart with a mix of shock and relief. It was my long-lost friend seemingly battling against the odds. I rushed to the aid, battling through the zombies with hits and pushes as he deftly sliced them with his katana. The fight ended in the blink of an eye, and we soon found ourselves catching up. I recounted everything that had happened since his disappearance. My relentless search, the cryptic blip on my ham radio, the distant gunshot, and the car I had prepared for escape. In turn, he shared his harrowing tale of being trapped by a blizzard, surviving in the woods overrun by zombies, and how the gunshot led him to the base. His curiosity was piqued when he heard my commotion from outside, prompting him to investigate. However, his explanation only heightened my anxiety. If he hadn't fired that gun or operated the radio, then who had? I was lost in my thoughts, my mind working at full capacity trying to make sense of what had happened so far when suddenly, a series of car horns yanked me back to reality. As I came to my senses, I saw my friend sitting inside a car, honking the horn repeatedly and confidently. After stepping out of the car, he explained his plan to draw all the zombies out and clear them once and for all so we could explore safely. It was a crazy idea, bordering on suicidal, even with guns and katanas at our disposal. But believe it or not, we managed to eliminate all of them and even snatch an additional bomb suit from one of the zombies in the end. But just for the record, I'll be keeping an eye on this guy from now on. He is kind of crazy. I spent some time scouring the battlefield later that day, checking bodies to ensure we hadn't left anything useful behind. Meanwhile, my friend Shepard, yes, that's his name, decided to loot the building just beyond the parking lot. And around 7 p.m. that day, he made a life-changing discovery. I found two boxes of nails. Damn, that's huge. Get a jackpot, dude. Two boxes? Three boxes. Damn! <laughs> <laughs> it keeps getting better, dude. And a box of screws, dude! Oh Jesus, that's crazy. Yo, a sledgehammer. Oh fuck, really? Do we have a sledgehammer? We don't, right? We don't! Okay, now we do. Three boxes of nails, one box of screw, a sledgehammer, shelves filled with brand new tools and guns. Just when I thought our day couldn't get any better, we stumbled upon barrels stored inside of the warehouse. Upon close inspection, we realized each barrel contained about 100 units of fuel, with a total of 30 to 40 barrels. If my calculations are correct, that's enough fuel to support the two of us for a year, or 64 people for a couple of months. We were ecstatic, losing our mind with joy. 
No longer would I need to venture out in search of gas with my tiny gas can. Instead, we can now focus on fully reinforcing our base. Using the cart we found, we could explore the island more effectively and find a way to escape this hellhole. But for now, our priority was to safely transport everything we found back to the mansion. So we got to work, loaded everything into the jeep, and began the drive back. Now the drive back was... rough. The increasing number of trees and car rack blocking the road made the driving experience extremely stressful. At first, it was manageable, with careful driving and on rare occasions, a bit of welding. But as the road became narrower, I had to let Shepard take the wheel while I got out to chop down trees to clear the way. It was hard work. Having gone through everything I've done in the past few days, chopping trees was definitely not on my to-do list. But as I saw my shadow cast onto the trees by the jeep's headlights, I felt a sense of comfort and accomplishment in adapting to the unforeseen. I felt whole again, ready to face whatever life throws at me tomorrow, knowing I was not alone.